Hello, buddies, fellow Franco fans, fans of the Franco Observer podcast. Welcome once again. I am your host, Jason Rudy, from Desperate Visions Productions, Sacramento, California-based filmmaking production company. I am a filmmaker. I've done about 12 films and multiple videos, other short projects. Um, I'm a photographer. Uh, I am a script writer. I am a painter. I'm an illustrator. I am a writer, a producer. I uh, do a little bit of acting. That's, uh, like I said before, one reason why I like Just Franco is because he was a multi talented man. Uh, do play a little piano, but not like he did. He was a great jazz musician. Not about great, but I, I, no, actually, he was. No, he was a he. He was a very good jazz musician, and um, very talented man. So for this, this is episode eleven, and we feature film number seventy one from Jess Franco, Die Sklaven, which is. Slaves. Um, the American title is Slaves, but yeah, Die Sklaven is the uh, West German title. Um, this is an interesting film from Jess Franco. He shot it uh, over like one, let's see, uh, one, two, three. He shot basically on like four different uh, filming uh, sessions. Um, Shot some during um, downtown, the uh, filming of that one. He shot some during Love Letters of a Portuguese Nun. He shot some of the footage during Barbed Wire Dolls. And then uh, the fourth one, I think, during um, White Skin, Black Thighs, during those two. So, yeah, he shot it basically during those four sessions. Um, kind of like a Plan 9, too. There's um, two of the actors in the... Uh, like they had uh, Martin Steedle and um, Vice's character, um, Ronald Vice. They didn't fly him back, so they had like stand-ins, kind of like they did with Bela Lugosi in Plan 9 from Outer Space, where you see his back, and he's carrying another woman. It's supposed to be her. And then you see her character dead at the end, uh, and you only see her nude from behind laying down, and it's obviously not her. So, so yeah, he had stand-ins for those. <clears throat> but uh, this is an interesting film. Uh, this was the second time I had watched it. I liked it better the first time, but it's very interesting knowing how this was put together, and it wasn't a prime, a primary production, but a collection of shots and footage that he assembled after the end of each day's shoot with leftover um, f- footage. Um, and, uh, yeah, that he put together, and after he was shooting the day's footage, he knew what he wanted to shoot and put those scenes together and then moved on in the next production, filmed some more scenes, put those together, and uh, threaded it all together. So it's interesting to watch that way. But, yeah, this is uh, Die Sklaven. It's the uh, West German theatrical title of this. Um, let's see, now I'm going to go through and do all the uh, credits and everything. Um, yeah, this is another episode that uh, Eric Whitwell and I uh, review the film, and uh, he's my co-host on this one. So for Die Sklaven, the West German theatrical title, it's a uh, Switzerland production, 1975. Original theatrical title in country of origin is Die Sklaven, uh, West German, The Slave Girls. Uh, alternative titles, <clears throat> uh, let's see, The Abducted, it's uh, Die Ver- Die Ver- Die Verschleppen, and then also uh, Die Sexhandler, West German alternate video title, The Sex Traders. Um, it's also uh, a 1978 trade title reported in Variety was Violated Women. Uh, let's see. Unconfirmed titles, Abducted, Seduced the Slaves, and White Skin on Black Thighs, which was later recycled for in German for a different Franco film, um, White Skin on Black Thighs. Uh, production company is Elite Film out of Zurich. Uh, theatrical distributor is Avis Film Avis Film Verlein from West Germany. Um, contracts were signed on this on August 12th of 75. 
uh, like I was saying before, uh, the first set of shootings was um, at the end um, of the productions, and he shot in uh, Berlin sur Mer from August 18th to 25th of 75, and then he shot on sets in Zurich in September of 75, and uh, more material on sets in Zurich in March of 76, and then the Portuguese shooting in November of 76. Uh, he got the certificate in Germany, issued on April 5th of 77, and it uh, premiered on April 15th in Germany in 1977, and played Zurich in August of 77. The theatrical running time in Switzerland uh, was 75 minutes, and the German print was 75 minutes, 13 seconds. The Blu-ray running time, the Ascot Elite one, is 76 minutes and 7 seconds. Director of the film, of course, is Jess Franco. Writer is Jess Franco. Producer, Erwin C. Dietrich. Music, Walter Baumgartner. Director of Photography, uh, Jess Franco in France and the camera operator in France. And Director of Photography in Switzerland, Portugal, uh, was Peter Baumgartner. Uh, production Manager in Switzerland and Portugal was Max Dora. Executive Producer is Erwin C. Dietrich. An elite film production released by Ava's Film Verlinth. World Sales was Elite Film AG in Zurich. Uh, uncredited Assistant Director in France was Gerald Cazell. And the still photographer was Ramon Ardid, which is Lena Romay's husband at the time. <clears throat> Cast, uh, Lena Romay plays Madame Princess Arminda. Adia Vargas plays Minu, Amos Radic's girlfriend. Martin Steedle plays Martin Radic. Victor Mendez plays Amos Radic, her father. Esther Moser plays Marta. And then uncredited on this is Jesus Franco as Radic's chief henchman. Uh, Ramon Ardid, once again, is in this as Raymond Armand's sidekick. Um, Sigar Sharif, also known as Sigar Sharif, plays Eben Holtz, black female crime boss. Uh, Peggy Markoff plays Vicky, an agent of Eben Holtz. Ronald Weiss plays Rock, an S&M client who works for Eben Holtz. Ada Gouver plays Lola, woman who escapes from prison with Arminda. Diata Fatou plays Tanga, a nude dancer at the Pagoda. Eric Falk plays a man reporting on Arminda's activities to Eben Holtz. Roman Huber plays a balding man dancing with Vicky at the Pagoda. Carl Geisling plays a police sergeant. Paul Neusbauer plays Jose, the police sergeant's gopher, also my leader. Di Sklaven is a complex tapestry of material cold from four different shoots spread out over 15 months. It began life in Bilou sur mer in the south of France in August 1975 during the making of Downtown and Die Marquise von Saad. With roughly 17 minutes in the can, Franco moved on, intending to add more material later as he'd done in 73-74 when he patched together films such as Female Vampire and The Hot Nights of Linda from shoots spread out over several months. De Sklaven's dividend, or I'm sorry, De Sklaven's divided schedule is evident in the film's photographic quality. Parts of it have the careful framing and glossy appearance typical of Dietrich's principal cinematographer, Peter Baumgartner, while other sections have a looser, grainier, more Franco-esque touch, with frequent handheld shots, odd angles, and a tendency to film in lower light conditions, suggestive on a smaller shoot with probably no more than three people as crew. The film stock in these, shoot, in these shots have the same grainy texture as downtown, as well as sharing cast and locations with that film. The Baloo Cinema material shot by Franco himself comprises the following eight scenes, and they list the scenes in uh, the film. Um, in September 75, Martin Steele flew to Dietrich Zurich studio and filmed some interior scenes with Ramon Ardid and Lena Romay. These shots must have been collected during studio filming for Barbed Wire Dolls, which also featured Steedle. We can prove it by comparing the scene in which Martine wakes up to hear Arminda and the Ramon in the next room with the incestuous flashback scenes in Barbed Wire Dolls. Not only do both scenes take place in the same studio set, but the props on the coffee table and bedside cabinet are positioned identically. In other words, these scenes were not just filmed on the same set, they were probably filmed on the same day. The presence of Ramon Ardid helps to pin down the shooting period, too. 
Ardith left the Franco Repertory Group in December 75 and never appeared in a Franco film again. So Di Sclavin's studio material must have been shot in the late summer of autumn or autumn of 1975. Working through the material and chronological in chronological shooting order, we come to a second bout of studio material, this time shot in March 76 during the making of Black Skin, or I'm sorry, White Skin, Black Thighs. It's doubtful that this footage featuring black dancer Dialto Fatu, who specifically intended for Di Sklaven, instead it was probably cold at a later date from takes that were not used in their entirety and White Skin on Black Thighs. A few months later, in November 76, Franco shot a great deal more footage for Di Sclavin in Portugal while making another film, the lavish and relatively expensive Love Letters of a Portuguese Nun. These new sequences, with comprised the lion's share of Di Sclavin, were filmed entirely with Edric Dietrich's blessing and, as already noted, are distinguishable by the relatively clean and clear photographic, the photographic style typical of Dietrich's right-hand man and DP Peter Baumgartner. And um, Peter Baumgartner says that confirmed that Franco shot extra material during the Portuguese nun shoot. At the end of each day's shooting, usually with leftovers, he filmed another movie that only he had in his head. And from these leftovers, he did another movie, Di Sklaven. I had fun watching this movie when I found it on the internet. Franco on screen. In addition to voicing the parrot, Franco appears on screen as Radix sadistic sidekick, coldly stubbing out cigarettes on Arminda's breast to elicit information. While we don't see burning flesh or even the cigarettes making contact, the scene has a startling nastiness undercut knowingly by the interpolation of a comic book image depicting a superhero saying, I've got to get out of here while being menaced by giant pincers. Cast and the crew. Fresh from the shoot from Women Behind Bars, where he played the v verminous Colonel Debris, Ronald Weiss here plays an S&M freak come private investigator looking for Martine Raddick. Music. The usual selection of cuts from the Baumgartner Sound Archive. The standout this time is a funky piece playing at the pagoda during the scene in which we first meet Eric Falk's character. The guitar, bass, and drum jab and peek at each other in a way that recalls Can or Electric Miles Davis. Locations. The exterior shots during the pre credit sequence, depicting a car driving along a narrow path beside a canal surrounded by lush vegetation, revisit a Portuguese location last seen in The Devil Came from Akasava during the shooting of Professor Forrester's assistant. The Belim Tower in Lisbon appears again, briefly but gloriously, in a rain-swept shot after Arminda's escape from prison. They also show that in Succubus. Lisbon's Ponte... 25 de Abril, a suspension bridge spanning the, month, the mouth of the river Tagus, can be seen in the early scenes of Arminda's escape from prison. The bridge was named to commemorate the Carnation Revolution, which the Carnation Revolution, which took place in Portugal on the 25th of April, 1974. A long shot of the Bugio Lighthouse, a tiny island just offshore from Lisbon, is cheekily made to stand in for Snake Island, the prison where Armand, Arminda is detained. The prison from which Arminda escapes is in, is the Forte de San Giulietto Berrera, near the mouth of the Tagus in Lisbon. The Ritz Hotel in Lisbon, featured in several close-ups, does indeed appear to have been the location for the hotel room torture scenes, as one can clearly see the nearby monument to the Marquis de Pombol out the window. The Pagoda Brothel is actually the Palacio de Montserrate in Sinatra, Portugal, making the Pagoda surely the worst well-appointed and architecturally lavish brothel in the world. The rocky coastline where Arminda finds the dead body of Martin is a well-known tourist spot called the Boca de Inferno, Hell's Mouth, located in Cascais, Portugal, less than a mile away from the Palacio Conde Castro, Gumares, where much of Love Letters of a Portuguese Nun was shot. Such close proximity meant that Freco could simply walk there and pick up shots for De Sklaven after concluding a day's work on the other films. The same locations were previously used in Julieta 69 for the scenes in which Julieta contemplates suicide. An architectural folly in the grounds of the Palacio de Montessere is a location for the Ransom Drop finale. UK Theatrical Release Disclavin appears not to have played in British sex cinemas. 
However, it's easy to get it mixed up with another Franco film of the Dietrich period, Satanic Sisters, which played in the UK as Swedish nympho slaves. Some sources, including the German DVD merchants, have used Swedish nympho slaves as an alternate title for De Sklaven. The UK poster for Swedish Nympho Slaves, however, makes it clear that the film is actually Satanic Sisters. The two actresses credited are the stars of that film, Karine Gambier and Pamela Stanford, neither of whom appear in Dysklaven. To make things more complicated, when Dysklaven was released on Swiss DVD by Ascot, many retailers erroneously listed the film's English language title as Swedish Nympho Slaves. All right, so. That wraps up the introduction and information and history and production history and credits and all that good stuff before the review portion of the film. Uh, the review portion of the film is coming up soon. Um, we're going to have a trailer playing next for Die Sklaven. And um, after the trailer portion, you'll hear the bumper music and then the review. Also, uh, as I state, you can get a hold of us at francoobserver at yahoo.com. That's F-R-A-N-C-O-O-B-S-E-R-V-E-R at yahoo, Y-A-W-Y-A-H-O-O dot com. Uh, francoobserver at yahoo.com. You can send any information there. Um, if you want to send any letters, any questions, any comments about the show, please feel free. I've had a few come in already, and I do appreciate it. It's good to hear from people, um, fans, uh, listeners, people that dig Franco and dig the show. You can add us on Facebook on the Franco Observer Podcast. We have a page for that. We have a page on Instagram for the Franco Observer Podcast where I post all the cool Italian Playbill posters I've been getting and the... Uh, where we shoot the Franco Observer podcast. I post pictures of all the DVDs and movies I've been getting. Um, I'm up to about 149 uh, DVDs now on my collection, and uh, I post pictures of all the places and the copies I've been getting so you can see what I've been getting. And, yeah, so I'm almost basically filled up on Franco. Uh, I've been getting a lot of this early stuff and the late stuff, so everything from the... Uh, black and white films the we are 18 and and uh the cougar and all those down to the spanish porno films of the 80s so yeah all all around um so yeah you can see all that there on the franco observer instagram page and franco observer facebook page and uh you can get a hold of us there find us there and add us and uh tell all your friends subscribe to the show on your favorite listening platform we're on iTunes, we're on Google uh, Podcasts, we're on uh, uh, Apple Podcasts, we're on uh, Stitcher, we're on a lot of places, all over the place. Just look us up, Franco Observer Podcast, you'll find us. Add us, subscribe, tell a friend. Let's get the listening up. Uh, right now we're doing really good. We're uh, gotta, If we double our average, though, we will get uh, more like advertising and then we'll get more people listening, so... Yeah, let's keep building numbers up. Right now, we're at episode 11. I want to go to about, you know, 150, 160, some episodes, somewhere around there. So let's keep building numbers, so motivate me more. And, uh, damn it, I want to bust these out. So hopefully you're enjoying them as much as I'm doing them. So that's that. Enjoy. Desclavin. Entführt, verführt, vergewaltigt. Rauschgiftschmuggel, Mädchenhandel, Erpressung. Millionen Erbinnen werden von internationalen Gangsterbanden mit brutalsten Mitteln zur Prostitution gezwungen. Die Sklavinnen. Aminda, ich will nicht. Du tust, was ich dir befehle, ist das klar? Nein, nein. Sie bringen Komm mich schnell, um. wir müssen das Geld holen. Ich bin eine Sklavin der Prinzessin Arminda. Wo ist das Mädchen? Ich weiß es nicht. Oh, 
Mach weiter. Ich habe das Geld nicht. Du lügst. Nein. Du hast es. Nein. Die Sklavinnen. Durch Drogen willenlos gemacht, haben sie keine Chance mehr zu entkommen. Wen hast du da gesehen? Martina? Radek. Oh, du spinnst doch. Wie soll die denn in der Minderspuff gekommen sein? Ja, der Radek spuckt bestimmt ein paar Millionen aus, wenn er seine Tochter lebend wieder sieht. Arbeiten Sie für Arminda? Nein, ich bin Bundespolizist. Bist du bereit, jetzt auszusagen und das Protokoll zu unterschreiben? Ja. Ja, ich werde alles erzählen. Ich war zwei Jahre in Armindas Pagode. Die Bullen versuchen immer wieder, mir etwas anzuhängen. Merkwürdigerweise haben sie damit bis heute kein Glück gehabt. Vielleicht liegt es daran, dass die Supertypen aus dem Polizeipräsidium die besten Kunden meiner Mädchen sind. Oh, jetzt werde ich dich. Und was springt dabei für mich raus? Wie viel willst du denn haben? Los, rede. Nein. Die harte Tour? Yeah. Nein. Lass mich in Ruhe. Lass mich in Ruhe. Nein. Nein. Ich, ich will hier raus. Na, endlich. Hör zu, du dickes Schwein. Ich sag dir jetzt, was du machen sollst. Ja. Ja, in Ordnung. Ja. Wo? Nein. Die Sklavinnen. Das Geld hat... Hello, buddies, and welcome once again to do the Franco Observer podcast. I am your host, Jason Rudy, and uh, this is episode 11 of the Franco Observer podcast, and I am here joined once again by my friend and co-host and guest reviewer, Eric Whitwell. Hey. So, uh, tonight we watched a film, the American market was called Slaves, uh, Daiskalavin, Dice, Dice, yeah. perfect. <laughs> exactly. I'm watching murder. As far as telling Eric earlier, I've never read German every week, and since I've started this podcast, now I've attempted to read German titles now every week. So it's it's good. It's helping me learn to speak another language. You know, Daiskalavin. So yeah, the slaves, slaves. Um, Switzerland, 1975. That's another film. The Erwin Dietrich producer uh, series that we're doing. We're watching all these in a row. We had started with Barbed Wire Dolls, Episode 8, and then did uh, Episode 9, Women Behind Bars, which wasn't Dietrich, but it was filmed right after. And then uh, Episode 10, uh, Downtown, and then this, Episode 11. Um, Downtown and Slaves, these were both featured the sheepskin rug, which was pretty big in this film. There's a couple scenes that were filmed in this. Um, uh, I don't know, it's kind of scattered tonight. So let me think. Um, this is an interesting film. It's This is the second time I've seen it, but now my first time watching it as in a review mode and a study mode. Um, it's taken from like four different filming shoots so that kind of explains a lot um i'm gonna while i sit here and think about it, i'm gonna say eric what did you think about the film uh it was it's was really interesting um really interesting the watching these you know having seen so many of these movies now in a, in a row uh you know it's you i witness like different scenes in there and like oh yeah that was from this movie or oh yeah that was this set in this movie You know, and um, yeah, it was really, really, it's just kind of cool to see how that was done, how it was pieced together and to, to recognize the different, different sets and locations and, and the whatnot. But um, it was, uh, it had a good storyline, um, it had a good storyline, it was uh, great locations, yeah, like beautiful locations. Really good, really good, yeah, like the... All the locations added to the film, a lot of the uh, really cool areas of Portugal and Lisbon and, and uh, just really nice things. That definitely was jumping in the film, you know. Yeah, it had a, it had some really funny moments in it that are just, like, really funny. Um, 
it had some randomness to it as well. Like uh, the guy reading the comic book while <laughs> while the woman's getting tortured with cigarettes on her nipples. Yeah, you know, it was just like it just didn't make sense, but it was hilarious. You know, just how he pieces some of those things into it. Uh, well, one thing we could say before I go into read the synopsis and that, um, Lena, of course, is a big presence in this film, and she has different haircuts from when they were filming the dark uh, Marquita Sod and this and and uh, downtown and everything, and her hair changes in that, and and her appearance changes a little bit through there as well. W- what did you think about Lena in this, Eric? Oh, gorgeous, man! Absolutely gorgeous. Like, she's beautiful, but um, yeah, it was kind of funny. There was no. Uh, need for um what's the what's the word uh no need for like when you when you when like something's placed somewhere and it and it's will always be there in the next shot you know oh, uh, continuity continuity yes thank you yeah i mean her hair that's huge <laughs> yeah well see because it's funny because she has like a longer hair but then, and those were supposed to be the flashback scenes, and then in the present day where she's interrogated, she has shorter hair, which I actually liked her a lot better looking. I, I mean, I preferred her look with the shorter hair in this. She, she, uh, you know, was awesome in this. But um, so here, let me get, let me set the table straight. And this is the synopsis of the film. And then after that's over, I'll kind of go through the notes and start piecing together this film because. That's what this is pieced together. It's kind of a good uh, analogy for this. Um, Okay, synopsis. A woman called Marta escapes from a sex ring, revealing to her rescuers that she has been kidnapped, drugged, and tortured by a cruel cruel trafficker called Princess Arminda. Already known to police as the proprietor of of a notorious sex club called the Pagoda, Arminda has, so far, eluded arrest thanks to her friends in high places. Marta's testimony provides the police with the evidence they need, and Arminda is sent to prison on charges of white slavery, drug trafficking, and murder. However, she quickly escapes thanks to the intervention of millionaire Amos Raddick. It turns out that his motives are less than cordial. He believes that Arminda is responsible for the kidnapping of his daughter, Martine, not to be cu- confused with Marta. Raddick paid a $5 million ransom, but Martine was not handed back to him. Arminda denies the accusation, and while being tortured by Raddick's right-hand man, tells the story of how she met and fell in love with Martine before tiring of her and drugging her with mescaline in order to break her down and make her into a sex slave for the pagoda. Eric Fox in this, he's pretty funny, his scenes. Um, he basically plays a guy that hits the club and uh, find, finds out footage about Martine and takes it to his crime boss. And while he's trying to have sex with this woman, a talking parrot voiced by Jess Franco starts making fun of him saying he can't get it up and he has a small dick and all this stuff which is pretty funny because the parrot's basically heckling the guy yeah that was that was really funny that was a good scene yeah it's when we first started eric goes so that is that just franco it was the two of war you can totally hear his voice and then reading the book flowers of perversion they definitely tell him that it was um so my notes basically on this um starts off with like some jungle shots and we get the usual menagerie of uh, sound effects that he used in Voodoo Passion and he used in some other films. We get the tigers, the monkeys, the, uh, uh, I don't know, whatever else. There's a wolf in there. Yeah, the wolf was thrown in there. It's like, <laughs> what the fuck? Um, this woman, the woman stumbles in from the forest, or from, I'm sorry, from the jungle, and she comes in a frame and uh, it's that black studio room with the trees in it that they used in um, uh, Bloody Moon, I believe. It's like So it's like a little studio shot, and it's supposed to be night, but inside the room, there's, there's daylight coming in from the from the window, so or it's supposed to be light, so it just did make sense, you know. But she stumbles in, and we know it's a police station because there's a, a uh, paper sign that's drawn or... <laughs> 
computer marked or something. It says federal prison. Or, no, uh, federal police. police. Yeah. yeah, federal police. It was just like like someone had drawn it. And it's stapled to like the fucking wall. You see that? <laughs> you actually see yeah. the staples on the sign. That was that was pretty funny. Um, they spared no expense. <laughs> yeah. And when Lena escaped, she's wearing the same black smock from Women Behind Bars. Yeah. Uh, the Volkswagen that she escapes in, Eric caught from Satanic Sisters. Uh, sexy Sisters, you know, uh, that one. Um, and uh, what else was the one? Uh, oh, and then uh, in her apartment, the brown um, kind of fabric that hangs in the door frame, almost like those door beads, but and that was used in downtown. I, I caught that. Yeah. And then, uh, of course, some of the same outfits. Lena wears that peach color top again from downtown in this. Um, and of course they have so much footage that they use from downtown and from, um, white skin, black thighs, some of the dance scenes. And then there's the same band that was in downtown. Um, Eric's favorite band, actually the drummer and the keyboardist, <laughs> He's like, the most useless band ever or whatever those guys. And yeah, and he had noticed too, that they had their pictures on the wall. Like, yeah. 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 I had pictures of them and it's like John D Hammond or something like that. Yeah. That's right, because they showed that scene in that. Um, yeah, so um, Martine Steedle is like becoming one of my favorite things about jumping into the Franco universe. She's she only did like five films from him, but goddamn, she was like just so awesome. Gravity around her boobs is like the greatest <laughs> thing in the world. <laughs> the way things bump off her boobs, the way they hang, the way they sway, the way they move on their own. It's just a fucking sight to behold. She's she's stunning. She is absolutely stunning. Yeah, and I know I sound like a pervert because she's like eighteen years old, but goddamn, there's she's one of God's <laughs> greatest gifts, man. I gotta say. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and of course, this is another film that has uh, I would say about twenty year old uh, Lena Romain, eighteen year old Martine Steedle in uh, in uh, Flagio extremo together or whatever yeah know. but it's kind of cool how he shot like their 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 scene together like he would do like a super close-up on their lips you know what i mean it would the tongues yeah where the tongues are wagging on each other and but it was just it was kind of cool like just what he would like focus on you know what i mean it wasn't like yeah it wasn't like a big standard shot it was like a i don't know i really like it, it added an intimacy to it yeah, he he definitely shot from a lot of cool angles with this in this scene especially. Uh, did like the upside down chin shots again with the chins coming together and the tongues, and then there's this cool lens flare that comes up on the left hand side of the screen. That's like a red deal, and he keeps that for uh, for about maybe twenty seconds. So that was a really nice shot, and then um, so yeah, those so basically, uh, Lena Romay's character um, Arminda, she basically brings in Martine. It's funny, Martine is called Martine again, and I think she's Martine in When Behind Bars. And I think... Um, was she Martine in Downtown? Yeah, 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 actually, let's see. I think she was Martine in Downtown. I think she was Martine in When Behind Bars, but Barbara at all, she was another character's name. I'll have to look it up in the introduction and, and tell you. But yeah, but she's funny that she's uh, called Martine in two of those films. Um, she... Uh, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. So so basically, uh, she brings her into the fold and, like, drugs her and gives her this mescaline. And, and uh, you see Lena Romay's husband plays her um, crime associate. And they, the three of them were together, Martine and, and him and uh, Lena. And me and Eric were just like, God, God damn, God, I was so fucking lucky. <laughs> He's like, I love my job. I love yeah, my job. Yeah. It was kind of funny, too, how he did a, how, when they had their little threesome. Um, right at the end of it, it cuts to a scene of a blowhole. Yeah, of like that, water that's, that's shooting funny. out of a blowhole because it was supposedly like in Hawaii or island something. Yeah, out of, uh, of Portugal, I guess. Yeah, and then yeah. Like, they show like the waves hitting the rocks and like in these cool like caverns and off, off the sides of the cliffs. <laughs> um, this film had quite a few of the Franco um, uh, castmates from other films. Uh, it's it's crazy to think how young Martine was and how strong she was. Like she was like yeah. she has like this strength 
and just this comfortableness about yeah, it. Yeah, Eric caught that, and then uh, Stephen Thrower had uh, written about it as well, about how her with her nudity is not vulnerability. It shows her strength because the way she carries herself nude. And, like, she's nude in, like, almost every scene that she's in this film. And the last film and, like, the last two or three films she's in, Barbara Doll, I mean, uh, Women Behind Bars, not as much, but she's, like, nude a lot in this movie and, like, all these movies walking around and the way she carries herself with the confidence and the strength of of her first films and just it's really amazing she's really a strong performer and really fucking cool that like the way she acts and everything you know um so yeah you had uh, Lena Romay um um Martin Steele of course um and then you had um, Vitor Mendez, who's the really big, heavy set fat dude that played Amos Raddick. He's he's, he's a, topless too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a scene where he's in bed, and, and Eric had to get up to adjust himself because he got a little too excited. <laughs> That's not a no. Uh, and then uh, let's see. You have um, Ramon, <laughs> um, Ramon R. Dead again. That's uh, Lena Romeo's husband. She she was in a bunch. Um, he was in a bunch of these. And then uh, the, the um, Peggy Markoff. That's who I want to make a note about. Uh, the gal that plays Vicky. She's in quite a few of the films. And uh, as I go back and watch the Franco films, I'm going to discover her and uh, learn about her because I know she's in downtown and she's in this and I think she's in succubus and I know she worked with Franco uh, quite a bit in his earlier films but uh, and then you have the guy that plays rock in this um, uh, Ronald Weiss and he uh, plays he it's funny I was reading about what his character is is rock an S&M client who works for Urban Holtz so he's a S&M client slash private investigator uh, who's also trying to blackmail this person. So that's kind of funny. Yeah, it's kind of funny too because it said like, you know, he's into like S&M, but he didn't do anything S&M. Dude. <laughs> yeah, he <laughs> basically, he goes to meet, that's so weird because he meets this gal, Vicky, who's played by Peggy Markoff, and then he's like trying to get information and he pays her pays her like, okay, because one guy wanted to have sex with Martine Steele and he's going to give her $200 for a half hour. And this guy gives Peggy Markoff, who's like maybe double the age of uh, <laughs> of uh, <laughs> Steel, and he gives her four hundred dollars just for some S and M play. He says, "Yeah." And then he just asks her some question. He he wants her to take off her clothes, and then he's uh, uh, runs around the corner, jumps around, or whatever. And then he's like, and then he starts beating her and asking her questions, and then I. Th- think he fucked her i'm not sure yeah that was actually a really cool scene too yeah because franco shot out like in the reflection on the corner of this deal you know yeah so that was really cool but yeah no he uh once he got the information out of it he goes all right now i want a good i want a good run for my four hundred dollars yeah yeah he's <laughs> and this is four hundred dollars back in 1975 too so that's really quite a bit of money yeah oh, yeah yeah i mean shit four hundred dollars now is a lot but four hundred dollars in 1975 that's like Cost of inflation, shit, I don't know, maybe seven, six, seven hundred dollars, something like that. I'll have to look it up and see, but yeah, that's like crazy, you know. Um, yeah, and they use the same cave area in Voodoo Passion in this film. And uh, yeah, there's there's a repeat of, like I said, the Volkswagen and the outfits, and uh, there's uh, the same furniture. There's uh, that red bed that's used in uh, downtown and, and, and all the other ones that we've noticed. Um, and there's, of course, the dance scene. Or how, how do I forget? There's actually a few dance scenes. There's, I laugh, there's a travel footage of like these uh, who the dancing women uh, dancing uh, island girls. I'm like, hey, there's the dance scene. But there's actually uh, the dance scene, the footage he used from White Skin, Black Thighs and from downtown where you see the people sitting in the rattan chairs in the black uh, club uh, with the black walls and everything. And they're watching the dancers, the, the, uh, African-American chick on the white, um, sheepskin rug. Uh, that's really, really funny, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. And they even use the bar area that they used in, um, what, uh, which one was that? Downtown. The bar where yeah, yeah, they yeah. worked at, like they, that bar was even in it. Yeah. And then Peggy Markoff's wearing that same head wrap that she wear in downtown where she's like in the, in the, in the crowd. And then it's weird. I noticed like, there's a footage of this a white dude, he's like a fat dude with a goatee. In the beginning, he's in the federal police, and the woman that comes in, he's questioning her about uh, Princess Armand. But then you see later on that footage, he's like sitting in the club with another woman watching this act, and it's supposed to be like a brothel. And I was like, 
why is this character there? That doesn't kind of make sense. So I don't know if that was the footage that he cut together and didn't realize that guy was in the shot or I've, I've I don't done, think he you know. cared. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think he cared. Cause it's funny, like watching this before just on a cold watch, not knowing any of the Franco history, I saw it one way and then watching it now with the, uh, past films I've watched and following this, this filming and the footage and, and everything connecting the film, I saw it in a, in a different way and knowing how it was made up. And so it's basically, it's cool. It's like he made this film while he was making other films, like his, like I had said before, and he shot a little bit here, a little bit there. So this film was never a film that was on its own as a priority. It was always like a side thing that was in the background of other things. And then as he got parts of it put together, then he went to Dietrich and then he, during the, um, love letters of a Portuguese nun, he went through and like shot a lot of that footage there and, and had it together. So that's a really cool way to do it because then you're, doing your primary goal, your primary project or whatever, and then still having this side thing that you're collecting pieces for. And, and like, it's almost like a, a car that you're collecting car parts for. And then you finally put the car together and then it can go out on its own, you know? So it's an interesting way to make films, you know? And that's one thing by watching these films and listening to this and learning and everything, you kind of see a different way to make films and that's a different mindset. And there's not just one way to do something, you know? So, yeah, no, it's really cool to see the way he multitasked. Yeah, and it's cool. Eric, Eric had mentioned that before about watching these with that mindset of it, of kind of seeing seeing it put together like that and, yeah. and everything, you know. So, but uh, so yeah, I mean, it's a it's a good film. I mean, uh, Lena's good. She's she's pretty intense in this. Um, you see Franco uh, kind of interrogating her with the bathtub scene. It was kind of cool you know that was a cool scene like yeah. he was really pushing her down like she was fighting back yeah and you could tell when she came up and like you know she was coughing and like that was real like that wasn't that wasn't acting like she they were struggling a little bit and then he has a woman in the scene that's uh, sitting naked in the tub and i was watching i told eric i said you know this woman could have been like kneeling outside the tub and her hands could have been in the tub or maybe she could have kept her underwear on and like sat down in the tub but instead he has her completely naked in the tub just just to have her naked you know <laughs> <laughs> which that was kind of funny um i didn't really uh, there was one or two continuity things that i caught maybe like just location stuff that was kind of funny i think with the the uh fake walls and stuff but that's really all i noticed in this i think yeah yeah i don't really catch catch anything like that um i mean besides the thing but i don't know i think i think the funniest scene was probably the eric with the uh crime boss woman getting it on with a parrot talking shit that was probably the funniest scene that was hilarious know? that yeah. that was that was really hilarious and it because it kind of came out of nowhere and in probably the low light was there's like a this like really unnecessary rape scene that's in there that's like way too long and like each guy there's like two guys and they like take their time and he and he just keeps on the shot like way too long and in the end the woman enjoys it like after it's over to like i don't know i just felt like it was just kind of like i don't know why they even used it in there i mean to show that how Lena was so evil and stuff to kind of show that scene, but you definitely could have had that way, way less than that, you know? Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, and, and use shots of something else. Wait, you know, shit, show Martine's ass for another 20 seconds. That's fine. You know? <laughs> another five minutes, shit, you know? So, yeah. But yeah, and also, too, if anybody uh, knows the whereabouts of Martine Steedle, she's like missing in action. I don't know. There's a lot of people that have kind of wondered what has happened to her. And, uh, with Franco no longer around and stuff, people are kind of curious to see because she hasn't showed up in any of these documentaries or anything of all the people that have done that and stuff. And huh. it's really interesting that she's only done like seven films, five for Franco, and then she was done in like two years, you know. So it's curious. Maybe she just got out of the business and that was it, you know. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, I know. She's, it's an interesting thing to kind of see what her thing is. Um, but yeah, so... Uh, I guess that's probably going to wrap up this edition of the Franco Observer podcast. Uh, is there anything that you want to throw in, or anything that you thought of that you want to that you're? Well, I was just thinking maybe like a. I guess by naming people their real names, you don't really have to have credits at the end, you know. <laughs> yeah, or if or if somebody's not answering to their character's name, you just call them their real name. They're always going to look at you, yeah. or get their attention to it, you know. But no, I, I you know she's actually a really good actress, like we were talking about before, and in this and. I mean, you know, how can you be good if you're only doing so many full films? But no, but she's very confident, and she's and she doesn't, you know. I mean, 
she's definitely good for the role that she was in and, and she's definitely strong in this and, and you know it's too bad that uh, people people don't celebrate her more as like a cult actress or anything I mean because she's done enough films for that thing as much as other people that have done the same amount of number or whatever in other films that are more seen you know or whatever but yeah you know she's this undiscovered gym you know yeah I'm really curious I'm actually yeah really curious what, what ended up happening with her yeah yeah Cause she's good she's really good so um and she's gorgeous oh god damn it she's, <laughs> she's fucking amazing <laughs> yeah she's the type of person where you watch a film and you just start let's start like moving around and yeah, I start punching the heater like <laughs> start stomping my feet and even now I'm just like kind of moving around yeah. yeah um well, so if you want to talk to us about her, you can reach us at the Franco Observer at Yahoo dot com. See, that's a smooth plug. That there. was smooth. That was smooth, <laughs> like her skin. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this is the Martine Heavy episode, as you can tell. <laughs> it worked into the lather. Well, actually, and behind me, there's a poster that I got from Slaves of her naked in the cell that Eric's looking at right now. So he can vouch for that. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a pretty amazing poster. Probably the only guy you know that has a Martin Steedle poster. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, You're the only guy I know for a lot of reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Damn straight. <laughs> so, yeah, this is... Uh, oh, yeah, one other thing, too. This was film 71 that Jess Franco shot, by the way. I always got to tell you the number of the film. Yes, yeah, so this is film 71 that he did in his filmography. Um, this is the third film that he did for Dietrich and um, yeah we both enjoyed it it was funny um, Victor Mendez is great and as always you know he's oh yeah also too another thing the scene where he's reading the comic book too they use that in The Girl from Rio when George Sanders is a crime boss uh, Maria Rome's getting uh, interrogated and they're putting her head into the water just like in this but a different scene And but in this one uh, he's watching what was he watching read the comic book again in this scene when the was getting Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, the yeah, cigarette. You know, yeah, the yeah. Cigarette yeah, cigarette he's putting the, the uh, cigarette on her nipple. Yeah, I know. I, I even talk about that. Uh, you, you did a little bit. Yeah, there's a good interrogation scene where Franco uh, burns uh, Lena's nipple with the cigarette, and then he drowns her in a bathtub interrogating scene, too. Yeah, this is not the first time he's had, like, lit cigarettes near, like, body parts. Yeah, okay. and also there's no uh, C in this. There's no well. There's a woman that dances with a lit candle, but she doesn't masturbate with it. So I can't <laughs> count that with the, with my tally of the bingo uh, the, the bingo game that we were playing. I forgot what it was the Jess Franco masturbation bingo or whatever it was. <laughs> I'll have to go back and listen to some it's of the a game for one. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think you can really go to the bingo halls and play that. No, or, no, no. or the uh, church gatherings or the, uh, you know, the pie tasting competitions or the hopscotch, whatever, you know. Yeah. The cakewalk, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, it doesn't really go with the cakewalk. So, so yeah, I don't know. It's kind of weird ending there. But, uh, so, yeah, if you have any good cake recipes, you can get us at Franco Observer at Yahoo.com. Uh, you can catch me, Jason Rudy, at uh, Desperate Visions Productions, Mondo Visions. We got a Facebook page just for the Franco Observer podcast. You can add that. You can find us on Instagram. We got the Instagram page on there. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, Facebook, blah, blah. You can find Eric on Instagram. Um, we're here in California right now, so uh, it's interesting times. We've got the COVID thing going on. A lot of places are kind of closing up, and it's kind of weird, but... Uh, I don't know. Hopefully this Franco podcast will keep you sane. I don't know. <laughs> keep me sane for a little while. Yeah. So, all righty. Well, thanks for listening. And uh, 11 down and 11 more to go. And then 11 more to go and 11 more to go. And all that way, we got quite a few. We're going to go up to 100 and something. So we'll see. Fuck. Yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> That's so, awesome, man. Here we go. All right. Well, thanks for listening. And I'll see you later. Beautiful nights. Beautiful nights.